Hello and welcome to today's Eurostar webinar, Coaching for Software Testers with Anne-Marie Sharish. My name is Miriam and I'll be your webinar moderator today. So before we start, I just want to bring a few things to your attention. If you take a look at the next slide, it's about the Q&A session. We will answer all questions at the end um, and if you have any support questions, I will answer them during the webinar. Um, this webinar will also be recorded and you will receive the recording via email shortly. So a lot of you have been asking how do you get the slides after the webinar. Well, we'll send those to you as well and they'll be posted on the Eurostar blog. Also, we have the conversation continuing on Twitter after the webinar. So if you want to talk to Anne-Marie, she's at Sharish and make sure you use the hashtag ESConf so we can find you. So without further ado, I'll hand you over to Anne-Marie and we'll just start off with a poll. Hi there, uh, my name is Anne-Marie and um, we have uh, just a quick poll, quick poll at the start. Uh, welcome all to this webinar. and. Um, if you would just quickly answer this question, how many of you, do you are currently actively coaching software testers? I'd be really interested to find out. So if you don't mind filling in that poll for me, um, that would help me um, just, just get a better understanding of, of who out there is coaching at the moment. Wow, wow, that's quite, so 62%, so uh, that's great. So um, it'll be interesting to talk to uh, a group of people who are experiencing what it's like to uh, coach software testers at the moment. Okay, so uh, we'll jump right into the webinar. Um, so. First of all, I just want to talk a little bit to you today about what the coaching approach that uh, I take. James Buck and I have been working on an approach for coaching software testers for the last two years. I've been working on it for the last two years and James has been working on it for nearly four years now. And uh, the coaching approach is, is what we're really trying to do here is we're trying to get software testers to teach them how to think for themselves, you know, because software testing is such a complex problem to solve and the only way we're really going to be able to solve this problem in lots and lots of different situations is if we have software testers who are able to work through problems and solve these problems on their own rather being fed information that they can actually um, a approach a problem and work through and identify and through logical reasoning, work out how they're actually going to solve their problems. So, so it's a, a, a bit of a challenge, you know. How do you actually get software testers to do this? Um, and so what James and I have come up with is, is that we've been working on this Socratic method of coaching. And today, what I want to do with you today is to really give an example of, of the coaching method and style that we use. And um, so I'll be giving you a bit of a demonstration um, of this Socratic method of coaching. And uh, what we're trying to do here um, through the Socratic method is, as I said, is get the testers to think for themselves, um, but also to try and help. In order to do that, we have to try and work out, you know, what they understand, what do they know. And um, in order to find out that, we have to test the boundaries of the person's knowledge in a sense, and help them to um, extend that knowledge. And it, the, the only way that we are finding that we, we, we do that is to, is to really help them develop meaning. So when we talk about knowing software testing, we're talking about what, it, it's not necessarily just words, but it's really the deep meaning behind that software. To, what exactly does software testing mean to someone? And in order to help be able to help that person get to that point, we really have to help them um, develop meaning uh, through actually performing 
testing exercises and actually getting the testers to work through challenges and to work through uh, subject matter so they can develop meaning and develop understanding through experience. Um, so, so it is all, all about critical thinking and really, you know, I, I love this, this um, image of, of the temptation to, to actually answer um, software testing through a sim uh, simply by, by just answer, by, by looking at things at a, at a superficial level. But, but we all know that software testing is a lot more than that. So as I said today, I'm going to actually take you through a coaching session. I have an eager student waiting for me, and uh, we're going to do this coaching session over Skype. Now this actual coaching session, normally my coaching sessions that I do take about 90 minutes to roughly, uh, 90 minutes to two hours, and we don't have that type of, type of time today, unfortunately, to go through the whole coaching session. So. What it is, this is really more of an excerpt of a, search, of a coaching session. I'm highlighting, uh, highlighting parts of the, the coaching that I, I hope you'll find informative and useful. So the coaching session that I'm going to demonstrate is one that I've had with, with, with a person called Simon. And Simon and I, um, this coaching session that we had, we went through um, a lot of time going through what we call, what I call the social elements. Are really getting to understand Simon, getting to understand what his qualifications are, how long has he been testing, what exactly um, does he want to get out of his coaching session, has he been previously coached before, and what's his testing experience. And what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to get an understanding of Simon's mental model, of, of his knowledge, of um, how he perceives himself, and a really a sort of model of who Simon is with respect to testing. And once I feel like I have a, a, a sense of that, then I want to get an understanding of, of his testing skill. And so I go into what I call the diagnostic phase where I'm really trying to figure out what exactly is Simon's skill level. And what I did um, in this coaching session is, is I basically approached it with three different types of questions. I asked him what is testing, and through that conversation, we, we, we graduated onto the top of, topic of oracles, and, um, and, and, and in order to, to really understand and, and get a common understanding, I asked him to, to test something for me, so I could really see how he tested something. So the coaching that I do, is, is, it's important that it becomes tangible, that it's something real not abstract and hypothetical. Because, you know, often that we talk in terms in software testing, we throw around phrases all the time. You know, uh, it, we want this testing to work as it's expected, and everybody nods their head wisely. Um, um, but really, what does that mean? I mean, is your definition of working as expected the same as my definition? Are we talking about the same product? Are we making assumptions, implicit assumptions, in, in just that one phrase? And the, the concept is, is to really understand um, and see if the tester understands if they know what they, if they understand what they know, if they understand what these terms mean. So, so I really go into a diagnostic phase, working out what the tester um, knows and, and perceives himself as knowing. And once I've got that, then we look into a therapy phase where I apply, um, maybe it's a learning phase, maybe I go into explaining what oracles are, um, or else I give them homework. Um, and this is, this is the phase where um, I, I want to help them um, gain learning and gain understanding. And so this is the, uh, the, the actual session that we're going to do. So, uh, without further ado, um, Miriam's going to hand over, um, where is it going? There he is, yep. Uh, she's going to hand over control, and I'm going to 
show you my screen where I have um, Duncan, um, Duncan Nesbitt, who's, who's very kindly offered to uh, stand in assignment. Um, he wasn't able to help me out today, and um, he's going to go and work through this, this actual coaching session that we had. Um, so, so that's the one. Okay, um, so as I said, this, the coaching that I do is over Skype. Uh, I have Duncan here ready, so I'm just going to type in Okay, so um, one of the benefits of working through Skype um, in coaching is that um, there's, there's two main benefits that I really see. The first one is that because I'm typing, it actually gives us both the tester and the coach an opportunity to really reflect and think about what they're saying. Um, and the second real advantage of, of um, coaching over, over Skype is that I have a transcript that I can evaluate and the student can also evaluate afterwards and analyze to really um, understand what was going on and they can refer back to that at a later time. Um, these, these transcripts have been fantastic in helping develop our coaching model because we've been able to analyze these transcripts and really identify coaching patterns. So today what I'm going to do is, is, as I go through the coaching, I'm actually going to start identifying coaching patterns and show you some of the coaching patterns that I and James use as we coach. And these coaching patterns are behaviors that um, we have seen, common behaviors, the coaching behaviors, student behaviors, that we've been able to see over analyzing lots and lots of transcripts. All right, so I'm going to ask him, as I said, one of the basic diagnostic questions I ask an awful lot is, what is software testing? Um, this is actually quite uh, a difficult question. Uh, it's, it's, you know, everybody knows what software testing is, but if you actually try and understand um, and explain it to someone, you, you'll start to realize what a, how challenging such a question is. So uh, Duncan's having a little think about this, and he's writing back. Okay, so he's saying that he sees testing as trying out a system to see if it works as expected by somebody. Okay, so this is quite a typical response. Um, it's actually not a bad answer, um, but I want to know more because for me, this phrase, it works as expected, is, can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So immediately, I'm going to apply one of the first patterns that I use, and that's called a drill down pattern. So using my Socratic method of questioning, I, I ask, what do, you, what do you mean by software testing? Okay, so I call this the drill down pattern. I'm trying to find out what exactly does he mean? What does he, when he says that? Or by Okay, so he's saying it it's, um, can be a spec. Now, this, this is a bit vague for me. I'm not sure exactly what he means here. Um, what could be a spec? So I, I'm not sure. So I'm going to... Um, okay, so he's jumped in. He's going... He was jumped straight into the topic of oracles. All right. So immediately I'm thinking about this, that he's actually... Um, and I see that he's been reading this today, and I'm going to apply a second pattern here where I really want to, um, I see that he's been reading by himself, and so I want to follow what I call following the energy. And I'm trying to hear is that 
see, I can see that the student is really interested in this topic, right? Because he's actually spent some time by himself talking, uh, reading this, this article. And one of the big things in the coaching is to really, you want to really follow the student's energy. And what I mean by this is that the whole coaching session is based around the student. And um, as a coach, I want to tap into the student's energy so that I can help him or her really uh, be motivated about their learning. And if, if I direct the coaching to what they want to learn, then I've got a much better chance of them being motivated and excited about testing. Where they, so they'll, when they leave the coaching session, they'll want to go out and they'll want to learn and inquire more on their own. So I'm going to actually go into this topic of oracles um, and ask him, you know, what is an oracle? Okay, so I'm, I'm really cutting to the point. I'm being quite direct here. Um, and I want to see what his explanation of what an oracle is. Okay, so <laughs> this is quite interesting. This is another very, very typical response I get back when I ask this question. Um, and it's a partially right answer. Um, it, it's, a, it's quite a superficial answer. Um, in fact, it's nearly, nearly to the point of a shallow answer. In, but it, because it's partially right, um, I think I know what he's, what he's getting at, but it's not, com not a complete answer. So there's two things I could do here at this point. I could actually challenge, say, challenge him straight away and say, look, this is not an oracle. Your, your, your explanation is incomplete. Or else I could actually take him through an exercise and help him see for himself what an oracle is. And so I've got two options here, and I decide to go for the latter. I decide to give him something to test. And um, so what I do is actually, you'll see on the left-hand side of my screen, you'll see that there is um, a, a game. This, is called, this game is called a scalper. And um, I often use this game, um, and I ask testers to actually test this. So um, you won't see this right now in the coaching session, but what I actually do is I, is I ask Simon to go away for 10 minutes and to test it and to come back and then I ask him to tell me my test. So we're actually going to skip that bit because of time and I'm just going to jump straight in and I'm going to ask him to tell me um, his test. Okay, so he's saying that if he tested it, um, he's tested it to see that basically, you know, does does the red square move um, to, if it hits the blue the blue um, blocks? I think that that's meant to be blocks. Um, by moving the red square, it'll quit. So he's testing the description of the game. Okay, um, and so I decide to um, to to challenge him on a bit. So I'm going to introduce now a, a new pattern, um, and this is called, a, it's another coaching action, and I call this polarization, um, because he says it quits the game. So what I ask him is, um, who says it quits? Right? So I'm taking a point that he's made, and I'm putting it in a situation where, um, where it might, you know, where I'm trying to get him to think where it, his statement might be, might be incorrect. He's made the assumption that, you know, that quitting the game is good. Um, you know, maybe, maybe quitting the game is wrong. Maybe this is actually a bug. And so I actually challenge on this and I'd say, you know, well, maybe it's, maybe that's not the right behavior. And then he goes, well, it could be a bug. Now, this is actually quite surprising for me because, um, you know, this is, the game quits. It's not like, um, 
this is unusual, but he's actually agreed, starts agreeing with me and he says that it could be a bug. So I'm going to start challenging on this, him on this because I really want to see, is this really what he believes or is he just uh, you know, nodding to me and just accepting what I say? Okay, so I'm typing in, you really think this is a bug, seriously? Um, and I'm, I'm starting to build up a little bit of pressure here. I'm pushing him a little bit more. I want to see what he, how he behaves under pressure. Is he able to explain himself? Is he able to uh, logic, uh, reason logically under pressure? Um, but, but he doesn't. He actually says, yes, I think this is a bug. Um, so I'm going to ask him why. Okay, so, well, he sort of answered this question already to say that, that um, nothing says that the game has to, has to quit, but I just want to see what, what he says next. Okay. Um, okay, I'm not sure what he's doing, so I want some clarification here. And so I'm building up the pressure again. Why is this a bug? This is another pattern that I use. It's called the repeat pattern, where I actually ask the question twice to build up the pressure. Okay, so he's confused. I'm going to help him out here. Um, <laughs> he's saying there's missing specs. He, he, he's not sure because he doesn't have missing specs. All right, so... Um, to me, this is, this is a, a clear example of um, a student who really doesn't understand why, why he suspects something is a bug. He doesn't really know why it's, it's, it is a bug. He's not able to explain. So it shows me that his understanding of oracles is not clear at all. So I'm just going to help him out here. Um, and I'm going to jump into a, to, into a mini lecture mode. Um, so I'm going to say... You think it's a bug, but you're unable to explain why you think because you don't know the oracle you are using. Okay, um, and so at this point. Um, I've worked through through an exercise with him. I've worked through, through a task. I've seen how he tests. I'm going to go into what I call lecture mode here. So, and I'm going to explain exactly what an oracle is. So, Okay, so I explained that the oracle is a principle or mechanism used to recognize um, a problem. All right, and then I go on to explain that requirements are just that. They're a, they're a source of knowledge, and I, um, but, but unless you evaluate and compare, they actually... Um, that you need to compare and evaluate against the requirements before they can become an oracle. Um, and, and so I helped Simon through his understanding of what an oracle is. Um, another thing that I like to do a lot is to use analogies. So I'm just going to cut and paste an analogy just to speed things up a bit, um, just to show you um, what what I do here. Um, so I, I use the analogy about 
water putting out a fire. And I say, you know, it's like having a bucket of water um, beside a fire. You can't really say that that puts the fire out. It's only when you throw the water over the fire that you actually can put the fire out. In the same way as oracles, oracles are, um, um, requirements are just a source of knowledge. And it's until you apply them against the product and evaluate them that they actually become useful in the sense of evaluating the product. Um, and so as, as we went through this, Simon gets a better and better understanding of what an oracle is. But I, I'm not quite convinced that he still understands why, why he thinks that quitting the game is a bug. So what, I'm gonna, what I do is I take it a bit further and I ask him to do some homework. And I do this an awful lot um, because I want, um, it's an opportunity for the, the student to go away and reflect about um, what he's learned and to take his learning further. Um, so I give him some homework and I ask him, I want him to think about why it's a bug and the oracle that, that he uses. And, and I stress that in order to be an excellent tester, we really need to understand these things. Um, and so Simon goes away and he actually does the homework and he comes back to me and I help him through it. So look, I hope this gives you just a little bit idea of, of a coaching session that I do and how I use actual tasks and real testing exercises to help a, a, a tester fully understand what it means to, to test, what an oracle is and um, where to, how oracles are used in testing. Um, I'm going to now um, give Miriam back the uh, control so she can actually um, take over the slides and we can just finish the rest of the um, presentation. Thanks, Miriam. Okay, so we looked at the coaching session. Um, the next slide that I want to show you is, um, is it's the coaching space that James and I have worked over the last year or so. Um, and so this gives an example. This is a model of the coaching set space that we do. Oh, we skipped ahead there. Apologies, there's a slight delay in the slides, so it just sometimes it's hard to get onto the right. Here we go. Okay, so as you see in the coaching space, we have both the coach and the actual student. And the coaching space is an incredibly dynamic environment. If you can imagine all this thing is happening on at the same time, you know, there's, there's lots of things going on. Um, the, the student is exploring a topic. The coach is helping that student go through the topic. There's whole heaps of things going on. For example, the context is changing. Um, the self-image, how the person perceives themselves, that might be different. Um, I want to find out what the student's aspirations are and also their expectations out of the actual coaching session. Um, I'm trying to really understand their ability and that's when we go into all these diagnostics, these coaching actions that I do. There are a lot of them are diagnostics to try and understand what their ability is. And also what's their demeanor? Uh, does, the, does the student come across as, as doubting themselves or, or are they tired? Do they appear tired? And, and some of these things are very, very hard to pick up over Skype. Um, and so, um, but they're very important to be able to understand and, and to be able to help the student. So, you know, I've got to be aware as I'm coaching of all these things and all these things are constantly changing as I'm going through the coaching session. I'm very, very focused on the energy. The energy is massively important in a coaching session. You know, because I want to follow the student's energy. That's the goal of my coaching sessions. If I follow their energy, they're going to become motivated. They're going to become excited about, about coaching and about testing, about software testing and, being, and wanting to be a great software tester. Um, the other thing that's really important is that you have a syllabus and, and a really understanding of what, you're going to of what you're going to teach. I teach very much from a context-driven perspective. Uh, so the actual um, syllabus that I've used, used is very much based on 
um, exploratory testing, understanding what oracles are, understanding assumptions, risk, and lots of different areas. Um, so I touched a bit when I was doing that coaching uh, demonstration, I touched a bit on, on some of the patterns. And I just quickly want to go through now some of the coaching patterns that I mentioned and also other ones that um, are related. Um, so I mentioned about the drill down coaching pattern where I try and get um, the, I, I'm wanting to find out exactly what the tester is thinking. I'm trying to, to see if there's any ambiguity, to examine the, the gray, the, any confusion that they ha might have in some of the terms that they're using. And so I'm using drill down here and where I'm trying to get this, the student to be a lot more specific about what they're talking about. Um, I also use another coaching pattern called polarization where I take a statement and I put it in a situation where it might, in, it, um, in the context is different so that the student or the tester may not have thought about his answer in that manner. And this is a way of, of adding, um, helping, helping the students see, see ambiguity and helping them to think maybe in a different way and forcing them to logically reason through their ideas. Um, but of course there's student actions as well. Um, many students uh, push back. Simon here didn't. He, there wasn't really much. Even when I pushed to them, I said, oh, uh, quitting the game is a, is a bug. He, he just accepted that. And that's an indication of, uh, for me that, that Simon, maybe he's lacking a bit of confidence or maybe he's just not really sure on the topic of oracles. So that gives me information about the student. Um, and the student action acts asking questions back. You know, if they feel confident enough about a topic, you know, or um, uh, the task that in hand, that they feel comfortable in asking questions back or asking me what I think. There's other things that we looked at. Um, there's the topic of syndromes. Um, one of the things that James and I have noticed as we're going through the coaching is that we've been able to identify typical behaviors that students have, um, which are, are things that, um, that we might be able to help. So we, we've noticed that there's a, there's a type of student called the wandering lamb where a, a student finds it really hard to focus in on a topic. And they find it hard to deal with um, complexity and depth um, in a meaningful way. And you know, when we have these student syndromes, what we do is we have coaching actions that we apply when these, these syndromes start appearing. Um, another, another student syndrome is a shallow answer. And this is when a student often replies um, short answers rather than deep, meaningful ones. Um, and Simon, on the whole, was pretty good at this. He was pretty good at answering, answering in a meaningful way. He was quite expressive. He didn't answer in just one short sentence or one or a couple of phrases. But um, I've noticed that many students you know, will just say yes if you push them or, and this is a type of, of a syndrome, um, and we've developed coaching actions to, to help them through that. So, and finally, of course, there's coaching syndromes. You know, um, one of the things that um, I've noticed is that in, this, in the session with Simon was that when I asked Simon to describe his test, I actually, that was a missed cue for me because um, Simon said a few things about what the test was, which on hindsight, when I went back and analyzed the um, transcript, I realized, you know what, that wasn't really a test, that was more of an observation. And I missed the cue there. I missed something that I could have spoken to Simon about. So um, that's a typical coaching syndrome where we, we miss, um, miss some behavior that the, that the tester has made. Um, another classic coaching syndrome is, is when the, um, the coach actually follows the student around the coaching space. Um, not adding very much direction, not helping the student very much, but really not, and 
really not knowing how to help the student, and we call this the wandering shepherd. These are very common uh, coaching syndromes, especially when coaches start out. Um, but I, the final thing that I, I wanted to show you was the um, is to really just break down what exactly I was doing in that actual coaching session. So when I go in and start asking a, a, a tester to test something or to perform a task, um, I call this exploring the, the scene. And this is actually a key moment um, where I'm, I'm watching what the student is doing. If the student performs a positive move, then I zoom in on that, I focus in on that, and um, I work through that. Actually, I've just realized that that slide is uh, back to front, so I apologize for that. So where you read positive, that should be negative. So if we take here the, 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 this side where it says positive and put negative there, then if I see something that, that is um, an odd behavior or something that I suspect that the student doesn't fully understand something, I'll focus in on that and I'll work through that using Socratic, Socratic work and um, exercises and tasks to really help the student understand more about the topic. Um, and then I close off on that session. If, if the student is actually performing positive behavior, I want to focus on that too. That's good. And so um, one of the things that's really important to end is that we highlight this and we highlight the, the good aspects of what a student does um, and show them why it was good and also um, how maybe they have, might have answered it really badly and um, just to emphasize how well they have answered the question. And, and then we close the coaching session too. So there's two ways that, you know, we want to apply both ways. We want to have positive energy and, you know, we want to be able to deal with, with the negative, um, with, the, with a negative um, situation where uh, there is not a lot of depth or complexity in a student's answer. So, look, I hope today that gives you just a little bit of flavor. I realized the time was really, really short. Uh, it was very challenging to to be able to show this show to you. I have so much more I, I, I'd like to show you, but I hope it gives you a little bit of a flavor of the type of coaching that um, I do. Um, I'd like to thank Duncan who um, stood in as Simon um, in this coaching session, and also Miriam for um, helping me with the slides and, and this this co this actual webinar. It's been quite challenging. Uh, organizing this from the uh, another side of the world. Um, I've got some tentative workshops coming up in Europe in, in, in March and May. These days are not fixed, but um, we're looking to uh, come up in, uh, to come to London in March and maybe in Sweden in May. So if you're interested, um, I'll, these, these workshops will be um, based on um, actually coaching, uh, co people on how to coach software testers. So if you're interested, feel free to contact me um, to find out more. So um, that's it. So thank you very much. At this point, I'll hand over to Miriam, uh, who will take you through the rest of the webinar. Thanks very much, Anne-Marie. That's a really good session. So, as Anne-Marie said, we'll open up the floor to questions. So while we're waiting for some questions to come in, I'll just go on to the next slide and just to remind you that we do have a webinar archive which has over 50 different webinars um, so all our webinars including today's will be up there in the next few days um, and if you're not a member of our Eurostar community um, now is your chance to join and you can access all these webinars then as well as ebooks, hundreds of presentations, um, videos and podcasts. Now so do I see some questions? Okay, Anne-Marie, we have a lot of questions. We, we may not get through all of these, so any that we don't, we will put on our blog. Um, and we well, don't worry, we, we'll get to your question. So let's see. Yeah, I will um, respond to the questions on the blog. Um, I'll make sure that I do that. So please don't worry if you don't get your question answered. 
Great, thanks Anne-Marie. So we have one here from Jean-Paul Varick. Um, so he says, Anne-Marie used a small test. I could imagine that uh, critical testers, this might not seem like real testing. How do you handle this critique, Anne-Marie? Um, I, well, what is, what, what is critical testing? I mean, why, why is something that is small um, not complex? I mean, I think the benefit of actually taking a small, small thing like a web page, which looks deceptively simple, is that you can deal with complex problems. Um, you know, these complex questions come up even in a simple website. I mean, what is testing? What is a test? Um, and if someone can't, can't answer questions for a simple website, you know, having, I, I'm not sure why, a deeply technical, complex application would be any any different, you know. Um, so for immediately, that would make me if, if if someone's not able to answer questions in this scenario, it would make me suspicious that maybe they're not might not be able to handle deeper questions, um, more you know, more these questions in a more technical or more challenging environment. Okay, so we have another question from Emile Swigler. Sorry now, Emile, if I'm pronouncing your name wrong. Um, so Anne-Marie, you say you follow the energy of a student. Do you also do this when it's negative? Oh, absolutely. Um, I guess um, uh, I'm going to take when you say negative energy um, as to someone who maybe pushes well, not which is back, but even if someone disagrees, I think that's great. I mean, this, if someone disagrees with me or doesn't doesn't agree, like what I'm what I'm trying to explain, it means they're actually starting to think for themselves, and that's what I'm trying to encourage. I mean, I'm not setting myself up as being the the font of all knowledge. What I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to encourage people to able to think and reason through problems with themselves, um, and I find if they if they don't if they don't if they take it that negatively that they don't want to be coached, then that's fine by me. They can leave. Um, I don't take that personally at all. Okay, so let's see. We have one from Misty Babcock. Um, is this type of coaching suitable for people who are completely new to testing or only those with some experience to give them a point of reference? That's a great question. I love that question. So thank you so much for asking that question. Um, I believe it's great for anyone. I love coaching people who have never tested before. In fact, I've just got someone on my team um, who I've started coaching um, who has never tested before. And, you know, it's wonderful to be able to start off and, you know, let them explore, let them to discover what, what testing is for themselves. Why do junior testers, why, why can't they, I mean, junior testers are, have a brain too, don't they? Um, they should be able to use it and think for themselves and discover for themselves what it means to test. Now, I might actually tailor my coaching a bit differently because they're junior testers in the sense that I might, um, I, I might, I want to make sure that they're having a lot of fun in the coaching, that they're they're really focused on actually performing testing and that they're getting real enjoyment out of it. So I'm not necessarily going to go through topics such as, um, you know, being influential or, or being able to persuade people and things like that. I want them to, to go bug hunting and find bugs and, and be really excited that they've just found some really deep, funny bug that no one else has found before. And I want them motivated and excited about testing. But but thinking, I, you know, people need to think from the start. Testing, the type of testing that I coach demands that testers um, be able to reason and think through problems. Okay, uh, we have one from Victor Pavlushkov. So Anne-Marie, your coaching seems to be personal for one student only. How do you teach testers to cooperate and exchange their knowledge? Wow, that's, that's a really interesting question. I've never thought of that. Um, I'm, I'm going to just make sure I make a note of that. That's a great question. Um, 
I do coach people to coach other people. Um, and so I guess from that perspective, um, what I'm doing is um, I'm putting them set in a situation where I ask them to coach. Um, and so they coach me. Um, and so I put them in a situation where they're, they're learning how to coach by coaching me. Um, so communicating with other team members, I guess I really, I would imagine that would need to be with other people. So I'm not sure exactly how I would do that. But I mean, I, I'd be really interested. I wish we had some interaction here where you could give your point of view because I'd love to hear it. Okay, um, we have so many questions, Anne-Marie. We'll definitely have to do a follow-up blog post. Um, I think we have time to take another few, so let's see. We have one from Neil Findlay. You mentioned about techniques to resolve wandering sheep and shallow answers. What are these? Okay, um, so, um, so shallow answers, um, really what I'm doing there is um, I will I'll, I'll basically um, not let them answer a question in a shallow manner. So I don't necessarily, if, if, it, if a student comes up and gives me a shallow answer, it doesn't necessarily mean that they have a syndrome straight away. It's only when I see a pattern of this type of behavior that I will, I will um, address it. And the way that I do that is, is I don't let them answer a shallow answer. I say, is that, is that it? What do you think about that? And I, I, I get them, I, I really force them to, to explain what they mean and find out why they are providing shallow answers. Is it because they really don't know? Or is it because they don't know the answer and they don't want to show that they don't know? Or is it because um, perhaps they feel embarrassed or, you know, maybe their English isn't very good. I think this is one of the, the downsides to Skype is sometimes it's really hard to understand um, and see all those different contextual things that are happening. You're not seeing the person's face. You're not seeing all these different things. And so that can make this type of coaching quite challenging. Okay, uh, we have a question from Matt Colson. Is coaching only for testers or can it be expanded to test leads and managers? Um, yeah, of course it can. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, the challenges that test managers face um, are different, but um, I've, I've coached um, test managers on um, interview. I've coached test managers on uh, risk test management. Um, and so really where there's a problem in software testing that demands that someone uh, thinks through it in a logical way and thinks through it in a critical manner, then, then um, yes, this type of coaching is, is suitable for that. Okay. Um, Duncan Nisbet also has a question. Um, in the explore scene slide, would you have many of these key moments in a session? Oh, well, look, that really depends. The thing about these coaching sessions is they're so, they're, I'm going to use a horrible word, organic. Um, you know, really cannot say at the start where the coaching session is going to end. And that's done on purpose because it depends on the student. This is all about the student coming to terms with uh, topics in testing, getting motivated, you're following their energy. And if their energy um, is, is maybe you start following it, it's going in the wrong way. One of the things that um, is often noticeable is a student will come to me and ask me to be coached and they'll, they'll mention a topic that they want to be coached in. But the reason why they're being asking that topic is, is, is because maybe their boss is telling them that they need to learn about this. They're actually not that motivated to learn about that topic. And as you start coaching, you start develop, realizing that, well, hang on a second, I'm not getting a lot of energy coming from this. And you, then you, you hit on something that they're really interested in. And, you know, at that point, you want to change your topic. So you do want to, um, to that key moment will change. Um, in my view, that's a good thing. Um, but if you have a, a student who actually is, is very sure about what they, are, or what they want to learn, is very motivated, 
then that key moment will will um, tend to be one, and that often that you can go into that topic in quite a, a lot of detail. And those are those are really exciting coaching sessions to go through, actually. Okay, thanks, Anne Marie. We'll take one more question from Rhonda MacDonald. Um, Rhonda says it's a great presentation, and in your experience using the Socratic method, how many sessions on average does it take to become proficient in coaching using this method? Ah, oh, so look, I have been doing this coaching. Uh, James coached me um, on on this type of method, and I've been coaching now for two years. Um, Am I proficient? I guess I'm, I, I feel a lot more comfortable about what I'm doing, um, but I think, I think it's, it's a life learning exercise. You know, every person is so different. Every time I coach someone, it, they've got different problems that they have. They have, different, they have a different context, and I learn something new. So for me, it, it's not about being prof proficient in a way, but it's being, um, it, it's having a whole world of of things to learn and that really excites me um, about coaching and I feel like I have this endless this endless opportunity for the rest of my life to learn how people work and and to learn how people think and and to learn new things myself Okay, that's great, Anne-Marie. We have so many questions. I'm sorry we haven't got to them all, but we will definitely, Anne-Marie will definitely get to them in um, our follow-up blog post. And don't forget that we'll also email you the recording and any slides. So I'd just like to say thanks um, so much, Anne-Marie, today. Um, I know it was quite late um, for you to be giving this presentation, but we all really appreciate it, and I hope everybody enjoyed today's webinar. Um, so this is the webinar is now over, and um, we hope to see you at our next um, session. Thank you. And thanks very much, Miriam.